I want to know what you guys think, Will and Charlie, about freeing the software code of big tech companies, because I don't think breaking these companies up or forcing them to moderate in a certain way is ethical. First of all, I don't think breaking them up is functional. As we saw with Rockefeller Standard Oil at the end of the 1800s, we broke it up into six oil companies. He had stock in all six, became richer and more you know, influential than before. If we did that to Facebook, we'd have Facebook Prime, we'd have Facebook Messenger, we'd have Instagram. Zuckerberg would own bits of all of them. He'd be even more, just as powerful, if not more. So I think we need to force free the software code and give other people access to the ability to produce that technology. And, and then everyone can have their own type of moderation methods. Like if you want to say no to a guy, the gay couple that wants to have the writing on their cake, you can do that on your social network. But I have access to that code so I can build my own version of it and allow that. And then the market well, will decide where people go. Let's, let's, let's translate that into a simple question of what do you think the solution is? I, I, don't, I don't think antitrust necessarily makes sense because who wants to use Bing, right? Mm. Yeah, antitrust in social media is a difficult one because I think they're natural monopolies, right? Like people try and say Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are meaningful competitors. Um, YouTube, I think, is one place where you can actually have meaningful competition. But Facebook and Twitter, it's very challenging because Twitter, I mean, I remember when Twitter was promoting Parler. Like they let Parler trend. They don't let things, <laughs> they don't want to trend, but they let Parler trend. And I think part of the issue was Twitter knows we have all the influencers, we have all the journalists, we have all the rock stars we have. Everybody uses Twitter already, and that's an impermeable, impermeable moat that means that competitors are trying to replicate what we're doing. They're not going to be able to, which is why all the social media companies do something really distinct, all the big ones, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, TikTok, et cetera. Um, and I think because they're so big, okay, then then we're in regulation world. Then we're in, you know, not, you know we need some deplatforming protections, non-discrimination rules. And I think it is tricky to balance the need to moderate awful content with the fact that we need to make these platforms open to make the First Amendment meaningful. Um, and so we want a world where they can moderate the really crappy stuff and completely st and stay out of politics. And it's challenging to draw that, that, that up in a way that is First Amendment compliant. Um, but I think it can be done because I think it ultimately you, you think from a civil rights perspective, it's like you, we need to stop discrimination on the basis of politics. But we, what, then, we just, what if well, it becomes well, okay for four-year-olds to twerk? We're, 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 we just, I, I want to talk about the, the, the Florida law, and we'll open up into that. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Florida, we just saw that uh, Ron DeSantis' legislation to protect people mm -hmm. was, it was, it was, what was it? it was, is there an injunction on it or was struck it down was by enjoined, a federal court? Uh, it was enjoined by a federal right. court. Enjoyed by a federal court, right, so it won't go into effect. Um, and, and that shows some of the issues, right? One of the things the Florida law did was it prohibited, it would have prohibited Twitter from appending uh, its notices to tweets. And the problem with that kind of law is that's a prior restraint, right? That's the government saying to someone, you are not allowed to speak. And that's always gonna be like strict scrutiny, very hard to get through. But one of the things that that case did do is it said, there's this case called, case called Pruneyard Shopping Center v. Robbins, a Supreme Court case, um, and in that case, you know, there was essentially a California law that allowed people to petition in shopping malls to set up petition booths or whatever. The shopping mall owner was like, whoa, 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 I don't want that. That's a taking of my property. That's also a First Amendment violation because it's compelled speech. I don't want to associate myself with these petitioners. Supreme Court said, no, you're not the speaker. You're, there's no First Amendment violation if a state wants to grant someone a right to use your property to speak if no one would associate with you speak and there's no like editorial component to it. Um, and the, the court in Florida was like, this is the path to, if you wanted to regulate these companies and allow people to have a right to speak on them, you could, that would be compliant. You just can't, you can't do something that forces Twitter to speak or associates them with the speech or uh, prohibits them from like appending their own speech and making their own point of view heard. What's the, Texas has a different law. And we heard from Alan Bakari that Texas's law is better. Yes. But uh, yeah, well, let, let's get into that. What can be done? I guess. Uh, I mean, what can be done is actually one of the things I've been proposing for a long time. You had a private right of action that says people have a right to be on these platforms. If they're wrongfully censored for lawful speech, uh, they can be have their accounts restored. But so then just lawful speech is always allowed. I mean, you could write a, that law saying uh, s writing a law that says you cannot kick people off of a social media platform for lawful speech. That law would be constitutional. 
mm-hmm. under the under the reasoning of this. But of this they have judge. the ability to blacklist people, shadow ban them, do all these things that aren't kicking them off. But you could essentially set their reach to zero yep. or, or next to zero. They could I mean, say, oh, you're allowed to post, but we will never show your feeds in anyone. Your, your post in anyone's feed because we're not obligated to. I mean, that's a that's a possible attempt to like weasel the way around it. Although I think, I mean, that's where you're still getting into. You're still discriminating. A, a well, a well written law. Uh, I think the Florida law itself said any form of suppression that puts someone outside of the normal function of the service. So like, uh, that's fairly obvious. You can't do that. But the courts would be like part of the normal function of the services. Blacklisting things that are dangerous. Judges are not robots. The the point, as you mentioned, of prudence is that a Mm -hmm. judge is going to hear and say, get out of here with that stupid argument. Well, you say legal speech, right? Legal speech. I mean, you can say the things that aren't imminent threats of violence, but are very violent. And that's legal. Mm-hmm. Um, social media doesn't like that because it doesn't translate in text the way it translates when you say it to someone a lot of times. Right. There, there will be legal challenges where judges will say it's an interesting point. This may border on something, but if there's no what criminal indictment for a threat of violence or incitement or anything like that, then it's legal speech, isn't it? Yeah. And I mean, maybe this allows them to delete the content, but it doesn't allow them to deplatform the account or something like that. Right. Like maybe, you know, because that then I mean, that that's actually closer in terms of a, a question. I mean, it's it, like it again, it's 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 a really difficult challenge to write a law that fits. But it's I think it's doable. And I think, you know, there's a lot of tech people who are like, you know, loving the fact that I mean, I read a big tech blog or the shill blog and they're like, ha ha, Ron DeSantis's law got thrown down. And I'm like, <laughs> I read the opinion and it kind of does lay out a path for a new law that would pass constitutional muster. Yeah. And I think the the idea of the speech is part of of the problem, the bigger problem of why they have the ability to censor speech is they have way too much economic power. And these companies are too big and they're Mm -hmm. too diversified. And your point is a good one that breaking them up can be very tricky. It can have the adverse effect. There is a way to do it. And Rockefeller is not the best example. The railroads are the best example. With Leland Stanford and how we use the Sherman Antitrust Act to actually be able to democratize the use of railroads, which basically allowed us to have entry into the entire Western you know, part of the United States, where Leland Stanford, who Stanford University is named after, built all the railroads and became under huge scrutiny by the trust busters of Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt's ilk and Howard Taft defended him. But by a different point is that there, there's, a, there's a right way to do this and a wrong way to do this. The right way to do this would be closer. The Microsoft case is tricky in the 90s. It slowed down Microsoft Internet Explorer. The, the bad way to do this would be, um, I think it's Bell. Is that, is that the right, co- the, be- the one they always yeah. met? Yeah, they yeah. broke it up. Yeah, and that one actually didn't work. That one had the opposite effect. But I, I'm of the opinion that until you restrict, and that's a big word for a conservative to use, but I just don't care because it's bad for our country, the economic domination that these companies have. And so the best offensive move, in my opinion, is Ken Paxton's lawsuit out of Texas, the Google ad lawsuit. It's really, really well written. And it goes to show how these ads are actually disenfranchising certain small businesses and they're giving certain preferential treatment to others. It's what, Was this like where they, they, they banned the pro-life ads? Yes, but it's even beyond that. It's that how, if you know how to word certain Google AdWords, Tim's Coffee Shop is not going to get as high of a preference as the Starbucks. That's a really good lawsuit. I mean, th- that story was crazy. I remember when it was uh, like a pro-life organization tried buying ads and they got told you're, violate, you're violating our rules. It's like this, this is a scary, uh, a scary world where people are just where big tech can basically say certain ideas have been removed from society at the whims of Mark Zuckerberg. And, 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 and only Mark and Zuckerberg. And that's really the problem here, though, right, is that the censorship is one aspect. We wouldn't be complaining about this if it was a censor of... Like, oh, I own a platform in, you know, I don't know, Manhattan, New York, and like I'm only going to allow transgenders to perform in my theater. We'd complain about it and write an article, be like, okay, that's just one theater, right? The point is that this, they have so much power they've been able to create through this kind of new world of being able, in my opinion, to have a very valuable company around not really delivering, in my opinion, a correlated meaningful service with the valuation of their company. And what do I mean by that is that Facebook is selling you. They're a massive data company. That's what they are, is is that they figured out how to individually mine you and sell back your data to the same 100 companies over and over and over again. Even if you don't use it. Yeah, even if you don't use it, right? And so Apple is similar but different. They're actually in the hardware business. And so this is something that I think could go 
a very dangerous direction. I don't think nationalizing them is the right case. I don't think we need to turn them into public utilities. But the argument that I hear is like, well, Charlie, don't you, you want all this innovation to stop from these tech companies? Like, yeah, kind of actually I do. I think that they're they're changing our humanity way too quickly. And I don't think it's a good thing that everyone's going to be wearing Oculus goggles in five years. In fact, I'd love to slow down their innovation. I want to preserve human beings and not be cyborgs. But you mean like the Oculus VR video games? Or do you mean like Neuralink? I, I mean, like, w <clears throat> how about eight hours a day on, in goggles instead in the real world? It's creepy, man. People play video games too much, too, for sure. I mean, we're using video so, games right now with these cameras. No, uh, let, let me tell you, I am, I am deeply offended by this, by this story that came out today. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was so offended. I was like flipping tables over and I was throwing things. It said, uh, grilling sucks. Yes. And it was, it was I like, saw that trending on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was like, your grill is filthy. The heating element is below the food, so the fat Who is cares? dripping into it. It's starting fires. Then you're putting your dirt, your, your, your clean food onto the dirty pile. And I was like, my grill has a heating element off to the side that pulls heat down it, and then brings a smoky flavor from, the, from the, mm -hmm. the mesquite chips that I can add to it. And it cooks my food very, very quickly all around the same time while I'm outside in the sunshine with my friends, enjoying a nice day outside because you don't want to sit inside all the time. So my point is, when it comes to video games, we need to be outside. We got to get that vitamin D from the sunlight. But it seems like more and more, yeah, they want, they, it's like that Black Mirror episode where they all live in the cubes, where the walls were TVs. Yeah. That's and, exactly and, right. and, and they, they had avatars in, this, in, this, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the stands at the you know, American Idol karaoke contests. It's and it's there's a it's it's very Huxleyan in the sense of just trying to pursue immediate pleasure and not virtue. People mention 84, 1984 a lot. Totally true. I think we're heading towards a brave new world a lot quicker than we are in 1984. And the tech companies are the they're the main drivers of this. They think that they are going to create this culture of pleasure. So you mentioned uh, Brave New World. I have not read it for my sins. Um, what about it makes you think that it's more like a Brave New World? So if I can talk a little bit about it. So Aldous Huxley was one of five kind of dystopian thinkers that were contemporaries. Churchill was one of them. Um, Arthur Kessler was one. Uh, he wrote uh, Darkness at Noon, which is one of the best dystopian books all about the Soviet show trials. Uh, George Orwell. Um, and then C.S. Lewis, who kind of dabbled in this kind of yes. dystopian literature a little bit. I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. So Aldous Huxley got a formal first from Oxford. He was super smart. And he wrote Brave New World, which is all kind of about this idea of the over excesses of commercial society. So they measure time as years after Henry Ford. So Aldous Huxley made a provocative argument that the beginning of the assembly line was the death of humanity, right? Huh. And so they, they, they attributed positive characteristics as saying, you're being very Fordly. They'd call it Fordliness. And so in Brave New World, uh, there's this famous incantation, right, that is repeated over and over again in people's sleep that says everybody belongs to everybody. And so in, in this dystopian future, you walk around with this thing called the Soma, S-O-M-A, which is a pill that is not addictive but gives you immediate and total gratified pleasure, kind of similar to this. And then the work, you go to work every day. The work is not hard. It's not arduous. It's just enough to make you feel like you did something even though you're doing nothing. And then during a very pre-planned hour, there is unrestricted group sex that happens every single night. And so the whole overarch, I'm not going to spoil the end of the book, the whole idea is the death of the individual, of monogamy, and this idea of the ultimate value in Huxley's world is pleasure. Everything is about how you feel and pursuing a dopamine rush. He may have got some of the details wrong, but he, it's already happened. Right. And so the, the, where I think Huxley was not as clairvoyant as Orwell is I think Huxley underestimated the role of technology. Yeah. Where Orwell, I think, was kind of creepily prophetic about telescreen and this idea of double speak and new speak double think and new speak and total continual monitorings and the psychology of a tyrant so if you kind of blend 84 and brave new world we're living through this a lot of different ways and i think the tech companies need to be crushed because they are destroying our humanity and they're trying to make people pursue pleasure and not virtue you know uh we we're talking to ben stewart he was on the show recently, and he was saying that it feels like some powerful entity is constructing itself through us. It's an interesting idea that it seems like everything we're doing, as you mentioned, destroys the individual. It's almost like, whether it's intentional or not, the actions of humanity today are, a dom are, are dominoes being knocked over that will create some kind of artificial intelligence and, and then ultimately result in us being mindless drones or eventually just dying out. 
Yeah, and so it, th this is this idea of the collectivization of society, right? We're already kind of succumbing to this of the three terms I hate the most, which is experts, extremism, and public health, huh. right? So those three things are always used as kind of conversation stoppers. <laughs> and the biggest one, of course, is public health. Not personal health, right? No, but public health. Thanks for checking out this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. If you want to see the full show, come back to this channel, youtube.com slash TimCast IRL, Monday through Friday at 8 p.m., where you can leave comments and super chat, and we actually will read your comments on the show. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and if you want exclusive members-only content, segments you can't get anywhere else, go to TimCast.com, become a member, and we even have full bonus episodes. Thanks for hanging out. And we'll see you all next time.